All right, uh, welcome all. I'm um, glad you could join us today. Uh, happy Friday. Um, it's just the start of my Friday here, but I know we're all in different time zones, so I'm sure some of you are completely finishing up your day, which means you can just sit back, relax, uh, and enjoy the presentation for today. So um, I believe I have my audio tested and video, and everything should be working fine. Uh, we also have this on recording right now, so we'll be good for the on-demand. Um, if you, everybody can just, anyone can just uh, give me the okay if you can hear me in the chat. Um, down at the bottom, you'll find your chat function. Um, I left you all a message there. Looks good. Okay, perfect. All right, so because you guys registered, I'm sure you know the topic already. Um, this is predatory publishing practice, what you need to know. And of course, we're gonna be focusing on what you need to know uh, today. So it's not gonna be purely an academic discussion of predatory practices, but rather how to deal with it um, in your own, uh, with your own publishing goals and your own journal searches, trying to find the best possible venue for your work. So um, yeah, we'll be discussing it um, across that range. All right, so um, a lot of you are returning. A lot of you come to these webinars that we have every month, and I greatly appreciate that. We love putting on this series. It's always excellent to see some of the same people showing up month after month. Um, for those of you who are first timers here, um, you don't know me yet. I'm Dr. Clark Holdsworth. I'm the senior manager um, communications and partnerships over at LetPub. Uh, usually I have my partner in crime, uh, Dr. Lachardi here. Um, she's not going to be in here today, so you just have me, um, but I've worked extra hard on this material to make sure we're getting uh, the best possible content to you. So I do have an academic background. Um, I received my doctorate in physiology from Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, so I'm a life science background, and you'll see some of my commentary, some of the examples that I use is going to be influenced by that. Um, but I do have experience across all academic realms because of my time um, with LetPub and editorial services. So my specific work um, really within physiology focused on uh, the O2 transport chain, uh, starting with ambient O2 air and going all the way down to the very, very low, almost anoxic PO2s of muscle myoglobin. Studied a lot of uh, preclinical models of dysfunction, such as chronic congestive heart failure, um, a lot of techniques related to uh, microvascular control. So that's a little bit of my background. And you'll, again, you'll see my commentary colored by it a little bit. Check chat. Okay. Okay. So yeah, today's topic: avoiding predatory journals, or at the very least, um, identify them and within the selection process, making sure that you're not falling to any traps. So. The way we're going to organize it here today, I'm looking to target because we're trying to shorten these webinars, make them a little bit more digestible for you. Um, I'm trying to target. Um, about 35, 40 minutes, somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes uh, to give us plenty of time for Q&A. So if you have specific examples that you, you want to ask about, um, you want to elaborate on things, you want to give examples of uh, other techniques you've had, um, we'll be open for discussion then and we can get all your questions answered. Um, but we'll cover the what are we here for. Um, this is really going to frame how we're thinking about predatory journals, particularly in relation to just bad journal practices, because you don't just want to avoid predatory journals, which can be a sort of narrow definition. You just want to avoid and avoid journals in general that are going to be of exceptionally low quality. What we'll do is go through ample checklists of identifying predatory journals. So again, I will give you checklists for giveaways for malicious intent, um, which is really what we're thinking of with predatory journals, but also just some things to look for in terms of journal quality and help direct you to the best possible ones. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to give you reliable journal search tips. So we're kind of trying to focus on resources that are out there, um, the types of platforms you want to be going to, the types of guidelines you want to be looking at, um, so that you can make sure when you're looking for these journals that may be newer, um, they may be less well known and thus a little bit less competitive, but you're trying to identify and make sure that they're adhering to best practices and that they're not predatory. So helping you in that search. And then finding good but safe opportunities. Again, this focus on you're, you're here and you're thinking about predatory journals because you've already exhausted that obvious list, right, of journals that people know are not predatory. Um, and so we're trying to 
give you the tips and tricks to vet a journal very quickly, even if you're not familiar with it, and determine if um, that journal, while it may be appetizing and seem like a good opportunity for you in terms of competitiveness, is it going to be safe? Are you going to have that journal be reputable five, 10 years down the line? Because you don't want to publish somewhere that's going to be exposed later on. And are you going to avoid completely predatory practices, which is just going to be a complete waste of your time, a complete waste of your study? And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A, of course. Okay, so to get into it for our introduction, definitions are always crucial, right? So what are predatory journals um, and how do you find these opportunities um, to publish um, outside of that really competitive scope of journals while avoiding these ones that may be predatory? Um, Definitions and categories uh, determine the approach to publishing in these quality venues. Um, the definition of predatory and trying to get into that gray area of a journal that's maybe developing a journal that's maybe quite new. And so some of these things that may appear questionable only exist because the journal is just very young and you don't want to lose that opportunity. So figuring out these definitions and the different categories of journals will help you to um, avoid the problems while not just turning away from what could be a good opportunity for your publications. So we want to differentiate in particular between bad or weak journals and predatory. Okay, so I've given two definitions here. Um, I selected these two, there's tons of definitions out there. I selected these two because I think they reflect the slight or subtle differences that you see between what's predatory and what's um, maybe poor practices or not best practices um, for a journal. So this first one comes from uh, Nature, an actual group that got together um, and took a long time to deliberate on the best way to define a predatory journal. And they're not the only group that's done this. I just think it's a quite reputable one um, that's worth, worth using as a base point for us. So predatory journals and publishers are entities that uh, prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship, and they're characterized most importantly by false or misleading information, uh, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, lack of transparency, which again goes along with being false or misleading, and the use, here is key, of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. I think that's a big one for predatory. The second definition I have here is a little bit more general one. It's sort of collated from like sort of wiki definitions, generalist definitions um, that you look up for the lay public. Um, an exploitative academic publishing business model that involves charging publication fees to authors without checking articles for quality and legitimacy and without providing editorial and publishing services that the legitimate academic journals would provide. So it's key here because what you'll see is certain aspects. Um, predatory, things that stand out to me are, are this example, aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. That suggests predatory. That suggests malicious intent that the journal's not trying to provide any value whatsoever. They're simply looking for authors um, to submit. That's a key giveaway. You can, however, have in instances where maybe there's false or misleading information, but it's not perhaps malicious. It's just an immature journal, um, perhaps journals coming from um, countries that are early on in their um, life cycle for the, developing their scientific community and their infrastructure. And I hesitate to accuse them of being predatory. However, it is still relevant because this is problematic for you. This would indicate a, a somewhat lower quality, but I think differentiating between these um, can be valuable, which is why I provided a couple definitions. And you can see even within the definitions, I think there's um, divergence between what constitutes actual predatory behavior and what constitutes maybe um, undeveloped or weak practices at a journal. Let me just check chat, make sure everything's good. Okay. So moving on, um, I've, I've subtitled this journal search identifying predatory, avoiding bad, and finding good, because I think that's sort of what you're trying to work your way through. Um, the big thing with what we're talking about today, I'm going to start with this up front because I was going to put it in the checklist as one of the early steps, and then I realized 
it's not even part of what we're talking about when we're talking about avoiding predatory or bad journals, because I could just, and I, I could stop and start, finish this entire presentation with just one direct step, right? Go publish in nature. You know, I'm being a bit facetious here, um, but you can just, there's journals you already know aren't predatory. There's a lot of big name journals. Um, you could just go publish in a society journal. That's something that's pretty obvious at the beginning. You find a society, right? An American Chemical Society, a Royal Society of Chemistry, um, the Physiological Society, American Geophysical Union, um, uh, AAAS, any of these organizations that also have publications, you can already identify, right? Okay, like that's that's not predatory, right? They, they wouldn't have all that um, if they were just trying to be a purely predatory journal. It just, it's, it's not a case. So we already know that the short answer is, is just go publish in the ones you, you know are not predatory. However, most of us are here. And the reason we're discussing this type of thing is because that's not our starting point. Our starting point is really that um, you're in a position where you have good, solid scientific work right? So all of you here probably have solid work, um, but you're having trouble in terms of competitiveness with that group of journals that you already know, that obvious group. Oh yeah, just go publish in nature. Well, publishing in nature is extremely hard, right? So what you're at a situation that you're in is you're looking for good opportunities to publish where competitiveness is reasonable, particularly as regards novelty, impact, that type of thing. And so you're looking for these opportunities and among those opportunities, this may be new journals, uh, and then by, meaning, by that meaning relatively young journals um, or just niche journals, these types of things where it's not obvious. And so you have to go through this process. So that's really where we're starting from. But keep in mind, if possible, the best way is to just go to those ones that are clearly not predatory, to go to society journals, to go to the big name journals, that type of thing. One thing I do want to address here uh, right from the beginning is open access does not equal predatory. Um, predatory journals saw their sort of heyday and this massive influx of them into the community at the advent of the open access movement because it provides the most convenient model for making money. Open access yielded article processing charges, which means you're charging the author, which means a submission and publication automatically equates to money for the journal. So open access gave rise to it, but open access does not mean predatory. All the major journals, Nature, right? They all have open access options and everything now. So if open access journals were predatory, like 99% of journals would be predatory because they all have that option. So it's important to keep in mind that we shouldn't equate those anymore just because predatory journals came into the fold during the open access movement um, doesn't mean we should think that's a one-to-one -one association uh, new journals are great opportunities and not necessarily predatory so that's another thing i want to get out there when we're going through this list of things and we're going through this checklist i want you to keep in mind that um, New journals are good because they provide those opportunities. If you have good work, but you're having trouble getting published in maybe your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and you're looking for other opportunities, new journals are good. They're going to have some weaknesses. That doesn't necessarily mean they're predatory. And we'll get into those, those details with the checklist. I do want you to be aware of the scope of the problem. Um, there's estimates of nearly a thousand predatory publishers with well over 10,000 journals, right? 10,000 journals that you have that are looking to solicit papers from you. And they really have either one, no intention of actually publishing it in a form that's findable or accessible by the community, um, or it's just completely useless. They're publishing your work with all sorts of garbage. So yeah, it's quite a significant problem. The other thing I wanna point out is Listings were commonly getting. Beale's List, of course, is a very famous listing um, by a librarian who started to put together these listings. What we're finding now, again, to go back to that idea of new journals, young journals, this type of thing, uh, journals from developing countries, these lists are not, they're not very functional. They are, bad journals can avoid the list and good journals can get pegged onto the list. They're very subjective. They're not centralized. It's very, very difficult. So while you might want to ask them, access them and sort of cross reference the what you're looking at, 
this idea that we can create master lists, which was the very start to deal with the predatory publishing practice, um, it's just not something that we're doing anymore as a feasible long-term solution. So just keep that in mind. Let me just check chat. Sorry, I don't have anyone in the background today. So I just wanna check on chat, make sure everything, we're not having any technical difficulties. Okay, looks good. Oh, um, I did forget, I'm gonna take a brief pause here because I wanna remind people, these questions come up quite a bit. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. This is recording and it will be out available on demand. Um, so you'll get a follow-up email. There'll be an on-demand link in there. You can just click it, go watch it after. So if you can't stay through this whole session, come back to it. If you wanna share it with someone else, that's awesome. We, we would love for you to share it with someone else. So just share the on-demand recording with them. That's no problem. So you'll have access to all this information afterwards. So don't worry about that. You get in a follow-up email within 24 hours. So just wait 24 hours to see if you get that. And then you can reach out to us um, if there's any problem. The other thing you'll also get in that email is a link to a webinar certificate. We know a lot of you are able to use this for sort of continuing education type things um, to add to um, um, sort of tenure and promotion files and things like this um, as records. So we do provide a certificate and you'll get a link to that afterwards as well. So just wait 24 hours and you'll get those two documents and a follow-up email from us. So just wanted to give you a heads up. Also, there is the, we have the chat, right? Where you can ask questions and or you can make comments right now. But if you do have a question, go ahead and click on the Q&A function and ask them at any time. It's great if you can like start collecting questions in there now for me, if you have specific examples you want me to go over, anything like that, go ahead, go to the Q&A, ask me a question. If you see a question you'd like, if you see the same question you were gonna ask, go ahead and please upvote it. Sometimes I, today we have a reasonable amount of people, so I should be able to get through all of them. But a lot of times we have a huge wealth of questions and it's a bit tricky to get through the most pertinent ones. So upvoting helps us a lot. So it goes to the top of the list and I can answer them in order. So be sure to add those at any time you want during this presentation. Okay, and back to it. So this is where we really get into the nitty gritty of the problems that you're gonna be exposed to. These are, what I'm gonna start with, are bad journal practices. These are things that you will see on checklists for predatory journals, but I think of it more as weakness, bad practices. Um, and these can be errors of omission, or they can of course be malicious, either one. But I wanna start with these. So the first one you see here is hidden or unclear author fees. Author fees should be extremely upfront. I expect to see author fees on the first page or the, or the second page that I'm viewing on the site, right? So this should be within the scope. This should be within the journal information, the about us um, alongside all of that other pertinent information like indexing and things that we're gonna go over. So. Author fees should be clear and they should be upfront. Ideally, you should have an idea of what your overall cost is gonna be um, immediately for those APCs. You should also be exposed to any information um, in terms of waivers, right, for APCs. Most reputable um, open access journals have some sort of waiver or um, discount system to benefit authors from developing countries. So you should be looking for those. And if you're not seeing that type of thing, again, it should raise some questions in your mind. The second one you have here is the lack of quality review of articles by experts in the field. This can be broad, but, and we'll go into a little bit more detail. So I'm just gonna leave it simple here, but basically you wanna look over the overall quality of peer review that you're seeing. And you can typically judge that based on the author guidelines. I'll give you some things to look for a little bit later. The next you have is incomplete or misleading reporting of policies, um, in particular, details like copyright and user licenses, uh, processes, personnel, performance, um, affiliations, things like this. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail on several of these as well, uh, what exactly to look for um, on the website. But this is obvious, right? A journal that's just trying to take your money. Uh, to publish papers, they don't care about copyright, they don't care about user licenses or any of this stuff, so they're not going to put it on there. Then you go into poor language usage. Again, this is a tricky one, right, because I think this punishes journals um, from developing countries uh, that are not English as the primary language and that type of thing. Um, but it is something to be aware of and should raise concerns because ideally a journal, if it's publishing in English language, if the site is 
not uh, communicating properly in English, um, then you are going to question whether the output of the manuscripts is going to be of any reasonable quality. So look for that, the low production quality, poor language usage um, in terms of the pre presentation of the journal overall on the site and in some of the articles. So you can quickly review some of the articles and see if they're letting stuff get through that's just really shouldn't even be, be getting published yet. Then you can move into the lack of ethics policies and the needs for ethics declarations, uh, particularly those related to human and animal studies and conflicts of interest. So again, take a look at the studies themselves. That's a good sign of exceptionally poor peer review if they're letting people get away with things that you would, you would look at as a reviewer and go like, oh man, you don't have like these basic statements that could be viewed as like unethical. Um, so if the journal's not making the authors do it, it's a good sign that they're, they're just not up to, to standard. And then look at a uh, lack of any corrections or retractions of articles. For very new journals, this is okay if they don't have much of this yet. Um, if a journal is like a year or two old, that's a little bit different. But any journal that's been around for at least a couple of years, they should eventually have some sort of corrections or retractions. Science is perfect, right? And the rate of retractions or corrections that we see is such that if they don't have any by that time, you highly, highly doubt that it's because the journal just got lucky, right? It's probably because they're not paying attention to it, which again is not adhering to editorial best practices. And then we move into um, the final one that I have here, the lack of ability for articles to be retrieved on an electronic search platform in perpetuity. So, <laughs> This is the most basic thing, right? When something's published, there's an idea that there's a record of it. That, that's the entire point of publishing is to edify the content that you have. Um, this is the only place you publish it because we don't do well publish in the scientific community. So if it's published somewhere, it needs to be available. If they're not making effort to do that, they're not really publishing. <laughs> they're not taking it seriously at all. And this would be a pretty obvious problem um, for uh, predatory journals. Moving on, I want to get into kind of obvious predatory practices. So these are the few that I really think stand out as obvious when the journal first comes to you and you should immediately sort of walk away. The first one here is guarantee of acceptance. Anytime they guarantee acceptance, it's just they're automatically invalidating their entire peer review process right off the bat and the promise of very fast publication time. So if they're trying to get you in because they're saying like, oh yeah, we can get you published in like a week or something like that, or in a couple of days, any reputable place cannot. There's a certain length of time that the process requires. And if they're claiming this type of thing, it's because they're not actually doing the process and they have no intention of uh, publishing your paper for um, any sort of real value. So be aware of that. Um, unsolicited offers to publish your already reported studies. This is another one. So if they're coming to you and they see, a lot of times you'll be getting emails about, oh, we saw your study and such and such. Uh, are you interested in publishing it? This type of thing, particularly as like a book or something like that, or like a review. If they're coming to you trying to get you to double dip, uh, that's already unethical. And it's a thing journals are looking out for to make sure authors don't review don't do this. Um, if the publisher, if the journal is trying to do it, it's a yeah, huge red flag. So be aware. And then no ability for articles to be retrieved at all, despite, despite being listed in a table of contents. So if there's any article there that you can't actually access, um, whether it's paywalled or not, if, if you simply can't purchase it, or it's supposed to be open access and you can't get to it, um, that's a problem. Now, if it's a very, very new journal, maybe like a university journal or something, and they're having technical, de diffi technical difficulties early on, they might have a staff of like one person, like one faculty member, maybe um, webmastering for the site or something. That's one thing. It's, um, it's a weak journal in that case, but that may not be malicious. But if it's, a, if it's a journal where you're just saying that routinely you can't actually access the articles that they're listing, they're not really participating in publishing or have any intention of partic participating in publishing. And this is a journal you don't wanna be going to. And then the other two red flags for me, and this may seem, sorry, this may seem uh, counterproductive, but there's a sweet spot for APCs. 
And if it's excessively high or excessively low, those are kind of big red flags. If it's really high, what they're looking to do is simply charge exorbitant fees from people who don't know any better, um, a sort of pay to publish model. They're, this will go hand in hand with the first point you see here in terms of guarantee of acceptance, right? That type of thing. And so they'll charge you excessive uh, APCs just to try to take advantage of people who have money and are having trouble publishing, or if they have very low APCs, because again, they don't care. There's no overhead. There's very low cost to what they're doing because they're not actually publishing or providing anything of value. And so they'll just charge very modest APCs. People think like, oh, that's like really good. Like that's affordable. That's a good deal. But, and so they'll just try to rope in as many people as they can. And they don't care if it's a low value because there's no cost to them anyway. Every dollar they get is pretty much free. Okay, so avoiding predatory journal. Now we get into the checklist. So these I can go through pretty briefly because these are just step by steps. The first thing is to check the record and most of the steps that you're going to see here should be found in like the about section or the journal information section um, of the site. So the first question is, does the journal have an ISSN number? <laughs> this is crucial. So either a print or electronic number um, for the ISSN should exist. And you can cross-reference these simply by Googling it and making sure it comes up correct with the corresponding journal. Make sure they're not putting an ISSN for like another journal or something like that. So I highlighted an example here of ACS Nano, right, which is a society journal. If they, if they don't have an ISSN, they're not even registered. They're not legitimate. They're not publishing anything. So that's the first quick check that you should make and you'd be surprised um, by how many won't come up as valid ISSNs for some of these predatory journals. So the next that you have is check the index. So journals will typically be indexed in several different places, but they should at least be indexed somewhere. And I would focus on ones that's familiar to you within your fields, right? <clears throat> so I give a few examples here. It's quite easy and I see a lot of libraries that um, offer um, advice on predatory publishing practices and how to avoid them. <clears throat> Excuse me. They talk about SCIE um, from Clarivate Analytics, right? These are the journals that have an impact factor, but you don't want to fo focus exclusively on this because there's plenty of good journals outside of the SCIE. So also look at EBSCO, Medline, PubMed, um, Scopus, uh, Geobase, and Web of Science. <coughs> and so you can see that example in the same one that I have down here, index and abstract, and in this case, CAS, Scopus, Medline, PubMed, and Web of Science. If they're in these types of index, it's not a guarantee. Bad journals sneak in, right? That's the entire thing that they're going for. They're trying to sneak their way into these, but it's a good first sign, particularly if they're indexed in multiple, right? So. Be sure to check that and give yourself an idea right off the bat. Moving on, um, editorial board. <clears throat> so it's crucial here. Editorial board matters a lot. Again, this info can be found right at the very beginning and the journal info it should give the editorial board right away. There should be some sort of editor in chief, right? Um, Non-journal staff, right? So you need academics in this position. And you should be looking at adequate number. A lot of times you click on the editorial board and it's just like a couple of people or it's a huge mess of people. And that's a bad sign as well. If you're seeing like 50 plus people or something and it's a small journal, it suggests that they're, whoever the scammer is trying to pass this stuff off is just going on and plucking names from the field. They're probably looking at a reference list for a paper, right? And they're just plucking the names out and adding them to it. So look at the numbers that you're seeing there and verify if it makes sense based on the scope of the journal you're looking at. It should be diverse too. If you're seeing them all from like the same like department uh, at one university, it can be a little bit problematic. You might see that a little bit more, again, with some of these um, institutional journals that are started for niche areas. That's okay. Um, but overall, you should be looking at that, and it should be something that gives you a bit of pause, a bit of caution, if you're just seeing this very narrow band. You should see more full details listed. If they're just listing a name, no contact information, nothing else, Again, you have to question because they're, it's the journal's job to be transparent, right? And if, if they're not providing anything beyond the names, it's just more possible that they're just being picked out of a list and added there. And so what you can do is simply go on, check that the information is current. So if they have like an EIC 
and you go ahead and do a quick LinkedIn check of them and the EIC's like institution listed is like different than the one they have there. It's somewhere that they were like two or three years ago. No EIC is going to let their information be outdated on the site. No editor in chief is going <laughs> to is going to do that on a reputable journal. So if you check that, that's a dead giveaway, and you just walk away from that type of journal. Okay. And then you want to look for contact and info. So finding contact info and finding routes of contact. Some form of contact must exist. Something, phone number, email, um, uh, sort of a help form type thing where you submit a message. Something needs to be there. Redundancy is good. If they have an email, if they have like a form that you fill out to send a query, these multiple types of things, if they have like a Tidio type function where there's a chat, that's even better. Um, physical address is a really good sign, but always check this, right? You'll Google it and you will see it come up as like an apartment building or something. That's never a good sign, right? So physical address should be listed. However, you should always sort of double check whether it makes sense or if it just looks like a sham. Uh, direct individual email is good. So if it's a contact person, that's ideal. That gives a signal. No, no one's going to have a direct contact person. Um, if they can avoid it, right, if they're a predatory journal. Um, but a support account is okay. That is common practice. A lot of times they have info at suchandsuch.com or support at suchandsuch.com. That is okay too. Um, and then telephone numbers are a good sign. People don't usually use telephone numbers anymore and it is kind of outdated as a communication mode. But if they're going to put their, again, this is one of those things where anybody that's trying to scam and just starting a predatory journal, they don't want phone calls. So they're not going to list a telephone number. Moving on, I think this is a really good one here that you want to look at partners, right? So partners and memberships within some of these crucial uh, groups reveal a certain degree of vetting. Again, they can sneak in, just like they can sneak into indexes, they can sneak into these groups, um, but it's a very, very good sign, particularly if there's multiples. So these are the examples I want to give. There's plenty more that you can also look up. Um, your library may have a checklist as well, um, but integrity and ethics groups are best. Um, Committee on Publication Ethics, COPE, everybody wants to be a member of COPE, and they do do pretty stringent vetting. So if they're a COPE member, that's pretty tough to get by. Uh, the Declaration on Research Assessment is a very um, forward-thinking, progressive organization focused on best publishing practices. So that's a good one. Coalition S, um, associated with um, achieving a better open access model, a model that's less of a burden to authors and less of a cost is another good one. And then certain industry ones, like Society for Scholarly Publishing and the International Society of Managing and Technical Letters. So look for these types of things. Again, <laughs> journal, journals may try to sneak in because they want to create that veneer, but the more and more that they have to do, the less likely they are to achieve it, to give you that impression that they're legitimate. So this stuff should start to add up and accumulate and give you confidence that it's a legitimate journal. And then I inserted some quick checks in here. So <laughs> talking about these types of things, these basic ones for predatory journals, these are some other quick checks that you can do. And I'll have another quick check section for when we're looking at journal bad practices or poor practices. Uh, for this one, start year. Older publications are safer. Again, I don't want you to walk away from newer journals because they do present good opportunities. But if you're looking at a journal and you check and it's been around for a long time, it's a good indication because predatory journals don't survive and the people running them just aren't interested in keeping up for that long. The other one is to check journal staff. Um, if they have journal staff listed, that's a good sign. You can always cross-reference on LinkedIn. Again, make sure that information is correct and up-to-date. Make sure that it doesn't imply that they're sort of just stealing identities, just listing people um, who really don't have anything to do with the journal. Test contact is a good way to do it. And I've done this on behalf of our authors sometimes. Send a basic question and see if you ever receive a response at all. You can simply email the support email that they give you, right? And ask, oh, can you send me or link me to your author guidelines? I couldn't find them. You can probably find them on the site, but asking a simple question like this and seeing if they can even respond to it. If there's anyone on the other end of the line, that's a good test. And then also you can check social media. 
predatory journals, again, they'll try to take certain steps to, to fake legitimacy, but something like social media is something they typically won't bother in because then they're putting in so much effort that it's like, well, we might as well just be a legitimate journal, right? They're trying to spend as little money and invest as little resources as, prop, as possible to fake their way through it. So social media is something they don't typically bother doing. And then you want to look at author guidelines. Uh, so quality of author guidelines. Article types, <laughs> they should list article types right off the bat. Um, diverse article types, I think is another good indicator. There is more difficulty, if it's just research articles, they can just take an article, publish, take an article, publish, take an article, publish. But if there's things like point counterpoint, things that require someone on the journal end to help um, facilitate and coordinate these, these types of things um, between different authors or different groups. Um, if there's um, editor's reviews or editor's commentaries, if there's these other things, it suggests, again, a level of effort that predatory publishers are not putting in. So look at diverse author um, article types to give you a hint if they are um, accepting um, those types of things to, to bolster your confidence. And then guidance on figures and tables. Again, predatory journals, Reputable journals, figures and tables are so problematic for them. They're such a pain. And so you'll notice author guidelines have gotten longer and longer and longer. There's all sorts of stipulations about figures and tables. You can see that they're very concerned about the way that you do it to make sure it's um, there's integrity in data presentation. And so um, the standard now is to have very, very strict guidance on these. If you don't see that, the, the chance is that it's going to be predatory because they just don't care about it, right? They don't care about integrity of figures or tables. They just want to publish your paper. And so they'll just ignore it. Um, and then look for required statements. Again, predatory journals don't care about these required statements because integrity is not the name of their game. Um, but most journals are going to be focused on things like funding, conflict of interest, data availability statements. These type of things are required for their membership in groups like COPE, for example. And so these required statements should be in there if they're not huge red flag. And they should also be comprehensive and detailed. This is a little bit vague, but again, go to those journals that you already know are reputable. Maybe you're having trouble publishing in them at times and look and, and compare them. If you're just getting a short thing, it, it doesn't have to be long actually, because some of these um, institutional journals may be a bit brief. They don't have a lot of resources, but it should cover all the sections. And then moving on, peer review process information. They should provide as much information as possible, at least something. And this is something that all journals are actually struggling with now. All journals are struggling to be transparent and they're being like reminded and pushed to be more transparent about their process so that they can be held accountable. The idea before was like, oh yeah, we do good peer review but they weren't being totally explicit about each step, even good journals, even very reputable journals. So this is a tricky one, but one, there should always be more than one reviewer. Again, like COPE guidelines, things like that, if they wanna have membership in those groups, it's required that they have more than one reviewer. Descriptive decision categories, right? So they should be giving you decision categories. Typically it's accept, reject with minor revision, reject with major revision, or reject outright, right? That's that's typical, but they should specify what the decisions are. If they're not bothering, not a good sign. And then they just tell you type at the very least, single double blind. There's there's a lot of information. We've given talks previously. You might've seen our previous webinars where we talk about the peer review process. This is a big, big topic. Every journal is telling you what type of peer review system they're using, single, double blind, unblinded, that type of thing make sure that they're reporting it. And again, this can be the type of thing that you can ask and see if you can get a response um, from the contact routes that you have at that journal. And then ideally they give you a process outline. And what I've put to the right here is actually from, uh, I believe this is from uh, Biomed Central. And so they give you um, a sort of walkthrough about uh, how theirs works. And it's a little bit general, but it's at least more steps than most are giving. So if you can find information like this, again, this is a way to bolster your conf confidence in the quality um, and, and reputation of the journal. And then policies and statements. Uh, look for explicit policies, documents, and statements regarding publication ethics. Again, predatory publishers don't care about this stuff. They won't bother putting it up. But if you're looking at an organization, you're seeing values listed, you're seeing codes of conduct, explicit editorial policies, conflict of interest statements for them, 
let alone asking authors to give theirs, but actually having their own as well, diversity statement and even privacy policy, something as simple as that. Um, very, very good signs. And then content and interaction for non-authors. This is another thing that's, um, all these things come together and I think it's something that people see sort of subconsciously. They go, this just doesn't feel like what a journal site an experience is supposed to feel like. And this is what they're really experiencing is the, the absence of a lot of these elements. So a predatory publisher just cares about the author because they're just selling the author a product. They don't care about librarians or advertisers or media and public or reviewers or anything. But what you'll see is going down to the footer of a, of a site for a real journal, a functioning journal, is they're going to have these types of listings for librarians access fee subscription model, advertisers will have like a prospectus or a rate card, um, definitely a contact email, medium public will have embargo policy and then uh, inquiry instructions. And then reviewers, they'll have like instructions for reviewers and a way for them to like put their name out there um, to possibly become a reviewer for papers in their field. So again, predatory journals don't care about this stuff. They only care about the authors and the money they're getting from them. So if they're adding these types of things, these are just the type of robust details that suggest a legitimate publisher. And so then I have a last couple quick checks that go in line with this. Submission system. It's not bad to have an email or an old school submission system, right? You just submit the manuscript via email to like a support account or something like that. That's not wrong. But if you do have a portal system like editorial manager, again, it predatory journals aren't paying for, <laughs> for the, the cost of those subscriptions to get those portals set up. And so it's just another step that should bolster your confidence. It's not something that should eliminate a journal from contention for you um, or define them as predatory or non-predatory, but it can be a good sign for you. And then the other thing is non-manuscript content, right? Plain language summaries, video abstracts, infographics, podcasts, all these things, these type of efforts suggest that the journal is taking seriously their duty of um, cultivating um, a collection of content for you and giving you a curated look at the science. And again, predatory publishers aren't going to bother with these types of things. And so then effective journal search, I just want to go over um, what you should be looking for. There's a couple resources right here. To access best practices, go to this thinkcheck.submit.org. They've got a great checklist. There's also plenty of library sites. You should check your own university first. There's pre plenty of library sites that are giving sort of primers on um, predatory publishers and checklists for avoiding um, submitting to them, um, including conferences as well, not just not just journals. But you can go to Think Check Submit and like fill out their form and actually get a scoring to give yourself confidence in the, in the legitimacy of a journal. And then you can start with reliable search tools. Of course, I'm biased towards PeerRef, the platform that we're on. Um, they have a great search tool. <clears throat> um, also, LetPub, um, the, the, the brand that I'm involved with, great journal search tool, um, commenting system that allows you to see information from your peers on both of those, um, and ask direct sort of questions, make sure people have actually published there before. Um, and then you can look at things like Clarivate Analytics, if you're looking at impact factor and that type of thing, see if they're indexed in local science or SCI, um, you're going to find out indexing, and then you're also going to get other information with like their master journal search. And then if it's open access, the uh, directory of open access journals. Again, this is a big directory and it's easy for bad journals to slip in, but it's a good place to start as a platform. So to review, um, and this is really something that you can um, screenshot now or in the on-demand, I think, and just take this as sort of a checklist, but predatory is predatory versus bad journals. You're looking for mali malicious or deceptive intent, and then you're trying to check off your expectations for best practices or weak practices. And then keep in mind, open access is not predatory. Please do not turn away from open access uh, just because you're nervous about um, getting duped by a predatory journal. Um, and always vet journals regardless of model, right? Um, work your checklist. So the checklist that I just gave you, work through it, identify the warning sign, and look for those key, the absence of key components. Um, confirm your author guidelines in the peer review process. Get the details, and if you can't get something, just walk away. It's the journal's job to convince you that they have a quality process in place, and if they can't do that, 
there's no reason for you to go to that journal. There's tons and tons of good journals out there. So just walk away if you can't get the information you need. And then add up the evidence. So tally the items you wouldn't expect from a predatory journal and weigh that evidence, right? And decide what you're comfortable with, how much confidence you've been able to build by going through that checklist. And then use available tools to vet the journal. Follow the best practice checklist that I showed you, the think, check, submit. Follow the checklist that I've written out here for you. And then start with a reliable journal search database. Again, bad journals can sneak into them, but it's a good place to start as a database so you can get a holistic picture. And in particular, so you can compare journals to one another. Those platforms can be very helpful for that. And so with that, I'm a little bit over, but I think we should have plenty of time uh, for the Q&A and get us done still um, under an hour. So, um, Okay, just as a reminder, so this will be on demand. Um, so you're going to get this whole recording. Don't worry, like automatically sent to you. You don't have to like make a special request or anything. You will get a follow-up email um, from the same place as your registration came. So it should go to your spam um, and you will have access to the full on-demand recording. And we are happy for you to share that with students, um, other faculty, anybody that you want. Okay, so the Q&A, let's uh, move through this. A uh, question about what do you mean by impact factor of the journal? Um, that's a good question because we have entire we have entire webinars where we talk about impact factor and journal search related to that. So I should I should review it briefly. Um, impact factor is the citation index provided by Clarivate Analytics, and it's based on the journal citation report that do they do every year. That's uh, quite famous. Uh, a lot of Previously, a lot of institutions have focused very heavily on impact factor and only publishing in science citation index expanded journals is what it's known as. And so impact factor, and this is this brings up another good point, impact factor will come from Clarivate Analytics. So just search up Clarivate Analytics or master journalist uh, for impact factor. And Clarivate Analytics has, it's proprietary. Only they can report the impact factor. So if you're seeing an impact factor reported by the journal and it's not matching up with the Clarivate database, it's illegitimate. The journal is lying. That's you, immediately, you should not be going to it. And please don't get duped into going to impact factor sites that aren't Clarivate Analytics, right? So Clarivate Analytics is the only site that you can really access to confirm those impact factors. Others can report. So like different platforms, PeerRef, for example, will rep can report that but you should verify it against Clarivate because they're just reporting, other platforms are just reporting based on what the journal itself reports, but Clarivate's the, the only reliable source. So that's what we mean by impact factor. And it is important to verify that you're getting a correct, there's, a, there's one and only impact factor. And it's important that you're getting the correct one. If they're trying to deceive you, it's, it's illegitimate. Um, what about time interval from approval of article submission and receiving the reviewer's reviews? Um, it may be longer than a year. This is tricky. So sometimes people think of like, oh, well, review speed should be a factor. And we covered it a little bit. If it's really short, that's actually a bad sign. And by really short, I mean like, the, the, the fastest reviews I've seen are like three weeks. Some of the Elsevier journals that are very well organized, have big uh, editorial staff and huge reviewer pools. They can return like a first decision in like three weeks or something. But anything shorter than that, you should be questioning whether the review process is even legitimate. So if it's very, very short. On the other hand, in my opinion, no journal should be taking that long to review a year and stuff, but I know there are certain niche fields like in mathematics and things where review periods are exceptionally long and it's because there's like there's only like one or two people for them to go to that actually can like evaluate that work. And so they may or may not be able to get someone, you know, to do the proper peer review process. So I know it is a little bit field specific. I would say though, if if peer review processes are long, it's a bad sign. It's at least a sign of a poor quality journal. And even if it's, even if you could argue that it's, you know, it doesn't reflect poorly on the journal, it's just not feasible for you. And, and is it really worth um, dealing with that when there's other journals who are uh, more expeditious with their process? So yeah, great question though. 
Um, this is a comment in regard to the quality of peer reviews. I think that it is a problem of the editors in many valid journals. You can find poor reviews, and the problem is that the assigned editors validate them. So this is not a characteristic exclusive of predatory journals, unfortunately. I agree 100%. Um, we've talked about this a lot. Um, even at good journals, part of the breakdown that we're seeing with the, pub, uh, the peer review process and this push to improve quality, even at quote unquote reputable, as you mentioned, um, is crucial because associate editors sometimes just aren't doing a very good job. They're letting reviewers get away with three sentence reviews. I mean, just some really terrible stuff. Um, reviewers will sometimes, I see it with our authors, um, they'll request they request changes that are specifically like contradictory to like the journal's guidelines and stuff, which the associate editor should know and be picking up on. The associate editors are, they're not really doing their job. They're just, they're just passing along the reviewer's comments without actually being, providing the editorial oversight that they're supposed to. So you're right, this is very subjective. Even with good journals, you're gonna get poor review process simply because peer review is hard. It, it's not an easy process. It's not easy for the reviewers. It's not easy for the editors and not everybody's doing a good job, even at the quote unquote good journals. Um, so it is a problem. And that's why that's why I'm not focusing as much on predatory journals here. You'll notice a lot of this was about bad editorial practices and identifying um, whether you think you're going to get a good peer or good legitimate peer review process. Not so much are they predatory because there might be journals that aren't predatory. They're not trying to exploit you. They're not trying to just get money off of you, but you're gonna to submit to them and you're gonna be extremely disappointed in the quality and the process. And so we wanna avoid those journals as well. So that's a great comment. I'm really glad that, that you left that for us. Sorry, I'm uh, speaking a little bit fast too. I hope this isn't problematic for people. I, I naturally speak a bit fast and I'm trying to just make sure we uh, finish on time here. Um, and in terms, there was another comment, um, you know, supporting uh, that previous one. And I just want to mention that um, we've talked about, the, again, I, I encourage you to go look at some of our other webinars, but um, in previous webinars, I've talked a lot about review speed and this type of thing. And a lot of journals are reporting those metrics now. Again, that's another good sign. Another of those confidence builder signs when you're looking at the journal and vetting it, if they're reporting the length of their peer review, um, a lot of the Elsevier journals do it, their time to first decision, that type of thing. It's a very good sign. It shows that they're concerned and transparent um, about their peer review process. And this question, what about predatory conferences? Just to keep this digestible, I didn't go into predatory conferences, but a lot of the criteria I'm pointing out to you about working through the website and identifying these things like contacts, right, lists, um, associations with other organizations, partnerships or memberships, all those checklist items that I gave you related to that type of thing, apply that to your predatory conferences, right? Um, and predatory conferences in particular, the most obvious is that predatory conferences are doing the things, like I said, like they're coming to you, asking you to present your already published work, work that you've already put somewhere else. Huge red flag, right? So they're doing a lot of the same thing as the predatory journals. They're soliciting work extremely aggressively. Um, oops. We had it. Let me just bring it up once more. Oh, actually, I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave it down for now. Um, we uh, we had it when I was showing that um, the aggressively soliciting um, work from you and promising that it's going to get published. The the journals or sorry the conferences are doing the same thing as the journals in that regard. So. Yeah, you can, you can use this checklist and carry it over. Um, is a journal associated with a popular publishing house a good sign? Sometimes journal predatory journals are associated with famous publishing houses. How to identify them? Uh, sometimes, sometimes. I think it's pretty rare that you have a predatory journal. You may have weak journals. Um, so as certain publishers expand, even though they may le be legitimate publishers, they may have weak processes at some of their new journals. They expand too quickly. Um, but generally, it's very hard for a publisher to have legitimate journals and non-legitimate journals, meaning like predatory. Um, that's very difficult because the publisher is in charge of like the whole process. 
they wouldn't bother. If they're going to bother doing all the work to produce some legitimate journals, they wouldn't then also be like trying to like do predatory things with like a different set of journals. So it's actually really hard, I think, for that to happen. The term pub popular though is pretty subjective. Um, I would say you're the safest bet is when you're looking at journals that are associated with institutions that are already credible, um, like scientific societies. I think I gave a lot of those examples, like journals from like American Chemical Society. The society itself has already established the credibility and a credible society is not gonna, going to bother publishing predatory journals. There's, there's no benefit to them. They've already put in the work. They can produce legitimate journals. Now they might have some weak practices. They might be doing some stuff wrong, but they're not going to be those purely uh, predatory publishers. Um, what about if the situation already happened to someone? Can it be republished again? I think this is meaning like, what if you publish in a predatory journal, um, realize it and don't want that anymore? <laughs> um, this is tricky. And I think this is something that you have to consult with the journals, uh, talk to someone like COPE, a sort of governing type body who might have more influence. But generally, I think if it's, if it's clearly predatory, I think you can get it retracted or invalidate it. Um, it's, it's technically like invalid anyway, right? If it hasn't really been published, if it's been quote unquote published by a predatory journal, as long as you don't appear to trying to be, double publication is only if you're trying to claim both publications. If you get duped by a predatory publisher, and want to invalidate that and then go get the work published legitimately with a good journal, um, I think that's possible because just make sure you're not trying to claim both publications and make it appear as two papers. That's the problem with dual publication is when you're trying to double dip uh, and gain an advantage um, from publishing the same thing twice. Um, and then what about aggressive publishers with high impact factors and having a fast review process? This is a great question too. I want to talk about this a little bit. It actually brings me back to something I think I, I skipped over a bit. So uh, the example here is given as like MDPI. You could talk about like a Hindawi or something before. And this is why I, I don't want you focused on lists because they can be wrong. Because publishers who maybe make some mistakes or they have a little bit of trouble um, with some weak practices at a journal or something, they can be invalidated as predatory when they're not. Um, and you'll have a situation where the journal is just growing and trying to improve and getting more, better and more robust. And eventually they might be doing better than like nature and science and some of these bigger prestige journals in terms of their process. And so that's why you have to look at um, the journal holistically and not try to peg them as black or white as predatory. Look at the whole body of evidence as I walked you through the checklist and then make your own decision. On the flip side, there's situations where you have, again, with the list, you have some that like look okay or, or have been deemed okay, but then later on, they start to have trouble. They start to deteriorate in their quality um, or they start to have uh, questions of, are they really doing a proper peer review process? I think um, with our authors, like OncoTarget was a popular journal for a long time, as like, as you mentioned here in this question, high impact factor, um, modestly competitive, not like super easy, not just like anybody can get into, but a great option relative to some of the other journals, because that's a space, um, oncology, a very, a very difficult, difficult area of basic science to get published in. Um, even in low impact factor journals, it's hyper competitive. And so a journal like OncoTarget was like a, a great, uh, no pun intended, target um, for a lot of authors because it was a pretty pretty good impact factor um, for people who that has a lot of meaning to, um, but not super competitive. You just had to have solid work and you could get in. It, it wasn't like it had to be like groundbreaking. However, even though they were like deemed okay or legitimate, after some time passed, it started to lose some credibility as certain things came up and people questioned um, how robust the review process was. So yeah, you should always be looking at aggressive publishers with high impact factors, but don't write them off um, until you see 
what their quality is overall, the whole body of evidence. And likewise, if you see a publisher that is, is supposed by the community to be okay, don't just go along with it because the community could change their mind three years later and you don't wanna have a paper in with them. Um, any experience you can share on how to republish already predatory published article? Again, I need to be careful about this one just because um, I'm not exactly that sure of the process for this. Um, again, I think in terms of like intent is crucial here and somebody is only going to come after you or have a problem with what they're doing if you're trying to take advantage. The idea of dual publication, the problem is um, that you are trying to inflate your publication totals, advance past other people based on that um, because you're doing dual publication. Um, so if you're not trying to do that, I think intent matters a lot. But in terms of the process, because it's hard because you want to go retract it, but like how do you retract it from like an illegitimate journal? Like they're not going to do that. And like there's no one that can make them do anything because they're not regarded as legitimate. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation. Um, Again, if it's a journal that doesn't even have like a DOI or anything, like technically it's never published. If it's a true predatory journal, it's not really published. There's like not even a record of it. Um, then you should be free to to go have it somewhere else. What I suggest is that you're extremely transparent with the journal that you go to. So the legitimate journal you go to, make sure you let the editor in chief know. Um, that this is a data set you had. It's really good. You you went to a predatory journal unaware of. Uh, where you're submitting, um, you know, just just give them the story and then explain to them that you've done everything you can to try to retract it. You've stricken it from your record and everything. There's really no record of this publication um, with this predatory journal. You want to get it published legitimately um, and just make sure you're transparent with that. And um, I think you shouldn't have too many problems. So, uh, but I don't actually have an author experience from that from any of my authors. So I will see if I can find out any more information and I encourage you to go to, I'm going to enter this right here. Go to the LetPub hub and I can deal with some of these questions for you guys. I think I can give you some better information on the hub over the next like couple of days, this week, this month. Uh, we always have the hub open for follow-up questions and that type of thing. So be sure to go visit us over there. Um, AV will be in there even though she wasn't in here today with us um, and we can answer any of those questions you have. She may have um, um, an example or be familiar with uh, that process and can give you a little bit more insight. So I just I just pasted it into the comments. So be sure to go there um, and check it out. And I think I covered all the questions and we're just a tiny bit over an hour. So I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, be sure to tune in for our next webinar. You'll be getting an email uh, from our subscription list and we'll let you know what the, the next webinar is for next month. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Please, please, please visit the hub, ask us questions, uh, have a discussion. If you have any comments or um, suggestions, um, if you want to let us know topics that you're interested in, uh, please visit. We'd be, we'd be very pleased to um, hear opinions, um, suggestions uh, from, our, from our attendees. So um, yeah, I want to thank you for attending and I look forward to seeing you all next month. All right, take care.